Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, my uh, question is for Dr. Fauci. Is there any indication that the efficacy of the current viruses, I mean, I'm sorry, of the current uh, um, vaccines are uh, in danger of being compromised by existing um, variants? And what is the uh, scientific data to show that? Well, there are a number of variants, and you'd have to take them one by one. Let me just give you some representative ones to give, I guess, uh, an answer to your broader question. So there's a variant that we're all familiar with now. It's dominant in our own country, originating in the UK, called 117. The vaccines that induce antibodies, the ones we use in this country, are really quite effective in protection against that variant. Take another variant, the one that is dominant in South Africa, the 351 variant. When you do in vitro testing about the, uh, the vaccines that induce antibodies here in our own country, the mRNAs and others, that you have a rather significant diminution of multiple fold efficacy in the test tube. But it isn't enough to completely obliterate a certain degree of protection. When you get the J&J, &J, which is the only one that has the field experience with that, you can see that you may not protect as well against symptomatic infection. The efficacy goes down to about 60 or 50%. However, it protects extremely well against advanced disease in the form of hospitalization and death. And then you have homegrown variants, the ones in California, the 526 in New York. The diminution is modest in the sense of two to three fold in the test tube. That's something that is telling us that likely the vaccines will protect reasonably well. The one that people are asking questions about is the 619 in, uh, 617, excuse me, in India. We are collecting data right now in real time and hopefully within the next several days to a week, we'll be able to make a determination as to what the effect of antibodies induced by our vaccines are against that particular variant. So again, a number of variants, different answers to each variant. Thank you. Next question. Josh Wingrove, Bloomberg. Thank you very much. Uh, Andy, can you talk a little bit more about the steps that the president outlined yesterday? You talked about a more granular approach to you know, get shots into every nook and cranny, more or less. Can you give us some specific examples of doing that? And he also talked about making uh, vaccines available as quickly as possible if they are authorized for that 12 to 15 age group. How are you going to do that? Is this our pediatrician's offices where you would target that? Is it schools? How, are, how is this age group going to be able to access the vaccine? Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Uh, I'll start with the, the 12 to 15 question. We obviously are awaiting the FDA's decision, and so I don't want any of my comments to be interpreted anyway, assuming uh, or pressuring the FDA on which way they're going to come out of things. But if it is approved or authorized, as we expect, um, we have the ability to move very, very quickly um, on a number of fronts. Number one, using the existing infrastructure for the distribution of the Pfizer vaccine. Number two, using infrastructure that has been deployed historically to pediatricians' offices to provide childhood vaccinations. Number three, engaging directly with people who our parents will want to talk to to understand, about, uh, understand these vaccines. So as soon as the FDA and I should say the CDC uh, committee uh, provides information, we will be getting that information to people so parents can make quick decisions. We know that kids want to go to camp this summer. We know parents want them to be safe. We know that parents prefer to have that done if they want that done without masks. Vaccinations are the best answer. Um, so we are prepared to move as quickly as we can after any kind of authorization. Um, in terms of the other initiatives the president uh, spoke about yesterday, he really broke them into a few different um, categories, but all of them are really thinking of them as leveraging um, a lot of the investments that we've made to date, number one, in making sure that we have vaccines near everybody. So we've talked about this with regard to five miles uh, within 90% of Americans, but what about the other 10%? People who live in remote and rural districts, so we are activating um, the rural health community um, network and moving vaccines there. Um, 
We are um, making sure that people who don't have access to vaccines because they just simply work all day, don't necessarily get the time off of work um, that, that we're hoping that they will get um, and just can't, maybe don't have the transportation or the child care, will be able to have walk-in appointments. So if you walk into a pharmacy, um, you should be able to increasingly get a vaccine without an appointment. Um, helping people find their vaccine, uh, the slide that Dr. Fauci put up, 438829, text your zip code. Um, people will be amazed at how, how close they are to vaccines. Um, in working with employers, uh, over a thousand businesses that are giving employees time off. Um, so you'll see, I think, a very long list of things that we've been working on, quite frankly, for months to get prepared for this time, to get prepared to communicate to people, to get prepared to make sure that vaccines find people if people aren't going out of the way to find them, to make it easy, and to make sure that people's questions get answered uh, when they're making decisions about how, to get, how and whether to get vaccinated. Next question. Carl O'Donnell, Reuters. Hi, um, thanks for taking my questions. So I wanted to ask you guys, um, you know, there's been plenty of reports out now that Pfizer has been um, distributing shots uh, to other countries from some of its U.S.-based manufacturing facilities. Obviously, that's different than, you know, the, the White House in you know, some cases, such as with AstraZeneca talking about um, helping provide some of its own allocations to countries in need, but it still amounts to, you know, the U.S., um, helping helping other countries access shots um, to a greater degree than before. So I'm curious as to what level of involvement the White House is having in sort of directing um, those exports. Are they trying to steer them towards you know countries with the greatest need, for example, the highest case count, um, or is this strictly sort of a private decision by Pfizer to you know other governments that it has its own contracts with? Thank you. Well, as you may be aware. Um, the prior administration prohibited the, that's, that type of export. Um, we've lifted that, and uh, to just to review some of the bidding so far, um, with our own vaccine supply, um, we have uh, been supplying vaccine, we announced, to Mexico and to Canada. Uh, we also announced that we would be um, exporting the entire block of AstraZeneca vaccines to countries that have approved AstraZeneca uh, just as soon as uh, we have approval from the Food and Drug Administration. One of the things the president announced yesterday is that uh, by the time we get to July 4th, a full 10 percent of our stock of vaccines that we've acquired will have been distributed to other countries um, at a minimum. Um, so that's very important as part of our commitment. Now, uh, Pfizer, as a practical matter, has relationships with other countries um, and strikes contracts with other countries. And we are pleased that we will be able to be a net exporter of vaccines and still have enough and still have plenty of vaccines to make sure we vaccinate the public. One of the benefits, I will say, of everybody getting vaccinated um, as quickly as possible is it will allow us to do a better job leading the way and helping the globe get their vaccines as well. Next question. Shannon Petty Peace, NBC. Hi, um, I wanted to ask about the summer camp guidance. Um, I was wondering if Dr. Walensky could respond to some criticism about having kids wear masks outdoors, given that you guys have all talked about the low level of spread outdoor and the low level of transmission among younger children. Um, you know, Dr. Walensky, could you talk at all about the data or the evidence that the CDC used to make that determination that kids need to be wearing masks outdoors, um, you know, just in all scenarios, regardless of vaccination status. Is, is there any middle ground there where kids wouldn't have to wear masks outdoors at camp? Yeah, thank you for that question. So we have two sets of guidance. We have guidance for masking and um, if you're vaccinated or unvaccinated outdoors, and we also have this camp guidance. Certainly, um, if we have uh, 
authorization for 12 to 15 year olds and they can get vaccinated before going to camp. That's what I would advocate for so that they can take their masks off outdoors. We also have guidance, um, the camp guidance um, and, and the outdoor guidance for individuals who are unvaccinated. So those who are 12 and under who are attending camp. And we have some um, availability of wear, not wearing your mask outdoors in small groups, in groups with other children who are vaccinated. Um, what we're really trying to avoid in this camp guidance is what we saw in outbreaks and camps last summer. So if you have five 10-year-olds who are on a soccer field all in front of the same soccer ball, we're trying to make sure that they're not a lot of heavy breathing around a singular soccer ball with five kids around it at the same time. But for spread out activities, um, uh, our outdoor mask guidance for unvaccinated people, uh, small groups, allows for those kids to be unvaccinated. And we, what we really are trying to do is ensure that all of these kids can have a really good camp experience and keep the camp camps open without any outbreaks. Next question. Last question, let's go to Zeke Miller at the AP. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Zawinski and Dr. Fauci. I was hoping you might be able to uh, expand a little bit about what the U.S. will look like, um, assuming the vaccination rate uh, meets, uh, and, and they, in the caseload looks like what you know, the best case scenario that CDC put out uh, in, in, this, in, this, in, in the models uh, this morning, you know, you know, the, you know, the vaccination, uh, the president hits his goal of 70 percent uh, vaccinated, 160 million double, you know, fully vaccinated by July 4th. What at that point, um, you know, should people expect or hope for uh, the country to look like, whether that be their mask wearing, businesses opening, sports games, you know, restaurants, you know, to the extent of, you know, can you provide sort of a, you know, a, a more of a reason for people to get vaccinated and to follow some of these mitigation measures in this, in this final, in this too much, two month stretch right now? I, I can start with that and maybe just say, you know, we're really looking forward to seeing that time. We're looking at both the rates of vaccination as well as the rates of cases come down. And it'll be the intersection of those two that we're really looking at. When we see that intersection, high vaccination rates, low case rates, we will look forward to releasing further guidance on, um, on releasing some of the restrictions that we currently have in place. Um, one thing I wanna just clarify here is while we talk about 70% of this country, these outbreaks are local, they're happening in communities. And so if we don't have 70% in any given community, this virus will be an opportunist and we'll have outbreaks in those singular communities. So not only is it 70% across the nation, but it is 70% 70, 70 at each of these individual communities. Dr. Fauci, anything you wanna to add to that? Yeah, yeah um, uh, Andy, certainly just to, well, to underscore what Dr. Walensky said, but also I mean, to take a typical example, I mean, if you have a community, it's very important to realize we live in a large country, heterogeneous, and you're gonna have different rates of vaccination, different levels of infection. But if you are in a particular community, a town, a city, or what have you, and you have the 70% vaccination that the president is aiming for with a single dose in adults, and you will see, guarantee, the level of infection go very low, you can start looking at things that you were restricted from doing that gradually you will see the CDC lifting the restrictions. That would be anything from indoor dining to the workplace, to sports arenas, to theaters, to things like that. I don't know exactly which it's gonna be and which will come first, but the bottom line is you will be seeing a clear, noticeable pulling back on some of the public health restrictions.